Uh, it is one of my uh, one of my goals to try to get on a TED talk. So this is part of my this is part of my, uh, my portfolio here. So if Ted, if you're watching this, this is this is for you. I was dreaming. No, no, no. <laughs> but we're um, recording. So, I'm not gonna lie. This is a this is a little intimidating. I know I wasn't the first. Like, I'm the first external presenter, um, at least here today. Um, and so usually I, I talk with uh, I have a couple of user groups around the DC area. Uh, That's where Anova is. We're a system of about 12, uh, 12 hospitals. And um, so I go to a number of different user groups. I usually like to attend them to kind of figure out uh, you know what they're like. And so I didn't really get a chance to do that here. So just just uh, uh, raising your hands here. Uh, how many of you guys have never used Nautilus? I don't think anyone here has never used Nautilus. All right, less than a year. Less than a year. Okay. Uh, less than two years. Your entire career. Okay, so people are in that. People are in that, uh, that type of. Thing. So, all right. So, um, you know, um, I'm really glad that this user groups. I, I don't know what the plan is for after this. I, I know for me, uh, going to user groups, uh, at least in the DC area, have been really beneficial for me uh, because I got to learn what other people are doing, learn from other people's mistakes. Uh, usually, people learn a lot from my mistakes. Uh, so, if you guys are interested, I, I'm a big believer in uh, self organization. If you guys are interested in doing like some sort of online uh, regular thing where we just do it on WebEx or something like that, uh, please email me right there. That's my email address. Um, and let me know that you're interested, um, thinking maybe doing once a quarter. Ideally once a month, but that's just. Um, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, ITMI. Uh, ANOVA Translational Medicine Institute is the research and genomics arm of ANOVA Health Systems. And what makes ANOVA really unique is basically our sample size. Uh, we're ethnically diverse, subjects are approached um, and consented right at bedside uh, while they're receiving treatment. Uh, we have a number of active studies. I'm not going to go into all of them here. Uh, one of my favorite ones is this infant mortality and gut microbiome. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but essentially what happened in the 20, 30 second version is that there was actually an infant that died at the hospital and through just uh, the course of analyzing the baby's poop, we realized that if we could have uh, ran some tests on that fecal matter, earlier we could have saved the baby's life. And so that's how that study got formed. Um, so a little bit more about me. Uh, so I don't know if um, I don't know if GeoCities and Tripod really ring a bell. I, I, I see a couple of nodded heads. Uh, so I learned primarily HTML and JavaScript uh, back when GeoCities and Tripod were a thing. I don't think I think GeoCities is still around. Tripod I'm pretty sure is dead. Um, uh, HTML is basic, is barely a programming language, but if you real, I, one of the things I realized is that if you want to interact with the user, you got to learn JavaScript. So that's the next thing I learned. After that, I picked up PHP to, to learn more of the back end stuff, and then just became a full blown lab staff developer uh, right out of, uh, right after college. And so that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, another big thing uh, that's important about me is that I'm a big believer in open, openness, transparency, collaboration. Um, you know, I, I think that in the principles of open source, the philosophy and the practice of it, it, when it's done right, it can bring down silos, increase security, and let everyone know how something is supposed to work. And it goes in tandem with the other principle that I'm going to talk about that, that's going to sound a little bit odd, but it's the trust in the user for their integrity. Users want to do the right thing. I don't know if you guys know this, but most people, when they go into their job, they're not out to get you, they're not out to get the company, in most cases. Not all cases, but in most cases, that's what they want to do. But they're still human, they're going to make mistakes, and, the, and these principles are going to come into play when I talk about universal accessioning. Um, so the, early, the, the earliest parts of Nautilus in, in how we developed our workflows was really, really, really hard. And it was, it was designed by my predecessor, not to badmouth him, but um, you know, I think he was still learning Nautilus at the same time. And, I, and I'll admit, the first workflow that I created, completely fresh into Nautilus, was horrible. And you know, the, these are actual. This is actual feedback that we got for how this workflow worked. And my favorite one is this third one here. Uh, you are screwed if you make a mistake. And it, it, that couldn't be further from the truth, not only from a user standpoint, but also from an admin standpoint. And to jump on that, um, the informatics side, the hard part of any sort of data system is that the data is not consistent. There was a lot of human error, and it took way, way too long to correct those issues. And so one of the, one of the really crazy uh, stories that I have is that um, 
the way that people log in plates was that you know you you type in the plate name and that, that's how it got logged in. But someone fat fingered uh, the the name and found some way to rename the plate and delete basically the name. So if you guys are familiar, there's a name and there's an external reference. And so they figured out how to delete the name, but the external reference was still there. So when they you know logged in uh, or they um, they thought they deleted the plate without letting us know. And so years later, we find out that this has been a regular practice of the lab. And so we had all these plates just floating around, doing absolutely nothing, taking up space, and we had no idea what they were for. We didn't know who created them. We didn't know what the reasons for them were. And so, but eventually this person, you know, just me talking about this frustration came clean and said, oh, that was me. And she was very proud about it. But it, it, it just gave the story that, you know, users at the end of the day, they want to do their job, they want to do the right thing. She thought that this was the right thing and obviously it wasn't. Um, so let me talk about some of the, let me talk about, this is perfect, best case scenario. Let's assume everything goes wrong. I, I'm sorry, everything goes right. There's a lot of back and forth here. So you have incoming samples. The pa uh, samples are then accessioned, but they're marked as, quote, unreceived. And then, process then the samples are received, and then it begins. So you got to go back and forth. There's a lot of mouse clicks here. And if you guys remember, one of the comments was that there are a lot of mouse clicks. And, one of the, and it's, it, it's one of the major pain points that our users have. And the, uh, if, you can't, if you can't tell, the, the top part is French actions. Bottom is not list. All right. So, let me, let me go into a little bit more detail here. So, so that picture just assumed that everything went well, but we all know that not everything goes perfectly well. So the common problems that uh, occurred was hand jammed errors, or you know, so if the barcode was un, uh, not scannable, they would uh, type it in, or the wrong amount was there, or the wrong time was there. So um, you have this receive time and then collect the time. So obviously in a a non-time um, non, uh, machine world, you will typically collect first and then receive. And so oftentimes, something would be collected at 9 and then accession at you know, midnight at 9 minutes because they didn't type in the whole 9 o'clock. And so you know, things like that would happen. But you know, the hard part of all of this was that you know, they, were, they were locked into this template. And they, couldn't, uh, they, couldn't, uh, they didn't have the power to edit that information. Uh, the other hard part was that samples were hard coded with pre-accession output. So if you're doing a if you're doing a sample uh, workflow, they had pre-accession output. So for example, we had a mom that had a blood, urine, and saliva collection. So if mom was able to provide all three samples at the same time, great. But let's say something broke in the system, so which actually happened. We had a urine cup break in our tube system. Now you have to go back and go recollect that, which in and of itself is a whole ordeal. But then when you get it sent to the lab, now they have to accession blood urine saliva again, but then cancel out the blood and the saliva because obviously we didn't have to collect it. So just things like that just made it very inflexible. So the other uh, problems during processing, we had all the wrong alcohols being uh, scanned. And this is not something that I really want to, I could probably do a whole other presentation about this alcohol not being scanned. We had this issue where, uh, long story short, Let's say the barcode was one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and your maybe thumb was covering the first half, so it was scanning four, five, six, but that got connected with the internal ID. That was crazy, because then we had an output that got moved from one location to another. It just was a mess. But anyway, uh, so uh, the other thing was that the child aliquots. Is it possible to scan like that? Yes. I yes, I wrote. I actually wrote a good, a good article about why we need to go to 2D barcode because of that very issue. The linear barcodes, they don't have a good check. Again, if you want more details about that, I'm, I'd be more than happy to <laughs> But I only have so much time. I have so much time. Okay. Um, so the other thing is that... 2Ds are so much better. Oh, they are. They're so and, they, and they're so much smaller. All the projects I've done for years are all 2D. Oh, yeah. Oh. Our instruments can only read 1D. Hold on a second. All right. The other thing is that um, we had to pre-accession all the alphas, so the lab would make these kits that were on this uh, 8 by 12 big plate where you put in numb tubes, and all those alphas would have to be scanned at once. But the assumption is that all those alphas are going to then be used. But there would always be this one or two. You know, they didn't get enough volume, so they would have to quote recycle. Uh, and that's some of the comments that we saw is that the, the act of recycling those alphas was incredibly time consuming. Not just for them, but also for us. Because the way that we had to resolve that was to go into the database and delete the rows. And it's just, it's just time consuming. It's just time consuming. There's a lot of things that we didn't, we didn't want to do. 
Wait, sorry. Did, did I just hear that right? You deleted the rows from your tables? Please, yes. Please, please, nobody else ever <laughs> So here's the trick. We don't have so much time. We only have so much time. Here's here here's my very short. No, you cannot delete any data out of Nautilus. From the table, yeah. You can. So here's my here's my here's my short short thing about that. So when is an alpha an actual alpha? This was an actual philosophical conversation that we had on our table. Because we were like, well, we have all these alphas that aren't real, because they were never accession. But they were, because there's a row, right? But they're not real, because the tube was never actually used. So is it real, or is it not real? So this, because now you've got to talk about, like, what you have to talk about usage, right? So we have all these dumb tubes that weren't real, that weren't actually used, but the lab wants to order. So how many, lab, how many uh, alphas do they actually use? So again, so. Long, this is a long story. Right. Right. Yeah. The original. Time, time, time. time. Right. <laughs> um, so, let's let's talk about non. Um, did I, okay, let's talk about non uh, non technical stuff. I don't know if anyone else is in this category. We would often have samples that would arrive at our lab, and they were due. No one knew what to do with them, and no one knew how to accession them into Nautilus because we basically had just. Blood, like urine, saliva, and other things. And the new, one, the, the the one that really pushed us to do this universal accessioning was fecal, because fecal took three. <laughs> it, it, it's very funny to talk about. Uh, it took three months to develop from uh, development to production, and it's just. Uh, does anyone else have this problem? Anyone else has that? Yeah. <laughs> so it's longer, so it's longer for you. Okay. So, so for us, uh, we wanted to trim that down because right now it's just me and Rachel in this. Uh, we're, we're hoping to hire a third. Uh, we actually have a job description now, but again, no, 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 no. Um, so the other thing is that it took, it, it, and that's just one alpha. If you, if you're, let's say you're collecting, um, let's say you're collecting belly button. That's my favorite go-to. Belly button. How do you accession them? How do you break it down into its parts? Um, and let's say you have a new study that's not just belly button width, but maybe toenail. You know, how do you put those things together and how do you build out that workflow? It could take us months to, to develop, to do testing and put it into production. Paper logs, oh goodness. When the lab starts and they start accessioning and we don't have we didn't have it ready, they just did it all on paper. And then they had to log this all in. And that became a headache in and of itself. And so there was also uh, very little consistent data. So something needed to be done. So fortunately, before I got there, the, my predecessor had this great idea that, yeah, let's, let's, let's try a little bit different. So it was a little bit more flexible. Uh, aliquot external references could be null. So they would, uh, so it, you, you didn't have to enter in a barcode. So if an aliquot was being recycled, you didn't have to enter it. That's great. Aliquot status could be set to cancel. So now, you don't have to delete that row. But now it's at the cancel. They did all the things that you need to do. But the, the problem was still that there was a two, uh, in the container type, it still said two mil nut. And yeah, we could have uh, pick, uh, fiddled around with the, uh, um, with the triggers, which we, we ended up doing. But um, Also, the uh, limited output details uh, could be changed by the lab. So things like external reference, so a fake fact thing or something, uh, they could edit uh, external reference, date, time, and amount. But the big problem that we had with this, and this was in our study 107, uh, which is our hard ambassador study, is that you could only do it under that study. So anything that wasn't study 107, which is about eight, ten of them, you had to do it in various different ways. And the problem with the problem that I faced when I got there is that there are there were a lot of these like one-offs. They, they they were similar, but they were different, and could and we couldn't really get everything close together. And so uh, again, the non-technical side, you, you know, we just had things come up that were completely outside of our realm, and we just had to do it because these are things that were coming in. And also the technical stuff is just, you know, with multiple before flows, errors were very common, and, um, you know, it was just really hard for us to react to the lab. So uh, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the Agile methodology. Anyone else familiar with that? How many of you guys actually do Agile with novels? That probably is, in and of itself, probably its own talk. But anyway, we, we can talk about that a little bit more. So this is our, this was the user story. So uh, basically, if you're not, uh, it sounds like everybody's familiar with that, so I don't need to go into it. So this was the user story that I came up with. As a lab tech, um, I would like 
to be able to accession all samples the same way, regardless of study, so that I can standardize my work process, increase throughput, and decrease the number of errors that I make. Very ambitious. Very simple. If you really think about it, it's really simple. Really hard to do. All right, so we started, I started collecting what I like to call the uh, requirements. Allow error correction. So if, I, if someone makes a mistake, make it easy to do. Uh, make it easy to, um, not only just to make that mistake, but also to go back and correct it. Uh, allow better out-of-pot recycling. So basically building on that study 107 and being able to tell a user, hey, it's okay, you made a mistake, or you didn't need this, but making it a little bit easier so they don't have to, uh, they don't have to freak out, because that was one of the things is that sometimes they would forget to right mouse click the out and say, recycle this out of Interchangeable workflows, I'm gonna go into that a little bit. Um, also, limiting overall development time. So part of, part of that software mentality is to try to reuse as much as you can. And so what can we do to make this simpler? What can we do so that we can react instead of doing this uh, development testing over two, three months? Um, better overall data consistency, which then leads to the standardization, which makes it a lot easier for the lab to get used to anything that comes their way. And finally, just reduce, I wanted my data back. Reducing the amount of time that we spent actually resolving these errors, going into the database, making these changes. We just, we, we, we needed to get rid of that. that. We just needed to get rid of that. Okay, so there's a saying in coding, uh, don't write what you can't borrow, don't borrow what you can steal. And one of the things, so what this means in, in just regular, you know, don't, don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Uh, so much of the workflows, like I said, were very, were very snowflake. Are you guys familiar with this terminology of snowflakes? Where, you know, very little, there's very little, little reuse. Uh, so the goal here was to modularize the workflow so that they can be used. So in Nautilus terms, this means we're using a lot of things like subtree, copy down, and other nodes that make, uh, that make data retention more consistent, okay? Uh, the other thing is that we trust the human, but I'm uh, sorry, trust the user, distrust the human. So uh, trusting the user is, is you know, the idea that once you train that person to do, do their job, that's what they're gonna wanna do. They're, we wanna try to make their job as simple and easy to do as possible. The, uh, the, the other part to this is um, if they're human and they make a mistake, you know, we want, to, we want to give them the confidence that they can make that mistake. And a part of that is going to be that transparency. So we do, I, I like to call it transparency, uh, security through transparency. So we audit all of our tables across the board. So that if a user does make that change, we see it. So, it, so we don't need to worry that someone is going to go in and, and trash the data because, well, we can point, point out what it's going to be. And so just having that audit ability and, and not just not telling them that to scare them, but telling them that because we trust them. Saying, look, if you make a mistake, that's okay. You know, we'll see that in the audit table, we'll see that you made a genuine mistake and you can just go back and make that change. And if we ever needed to reverse that, we could. But just telling that user and giving that level of confidence saying, look, we know that you can do this. But if you can or if you make a mistake, it's easy to correct. Um, and so the other thing too is that if you can simplify the workflow, they're going to want to do it more. They're going to want to not try to find a back door and erase that name field and give you a whole lot of, a whole lot of other work. And so it's simplifying the use, make it easy to do uh, so that the end user is happy and they can do their job. So I'm going to start what I like to call the lowest level alpha, which it isn't, but it, for all intents and purposes, for the scope of this meeting, I don't know how much time I have. I have seven minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is a secondary aliquot. Um, it's never directly accession. What I mean by that is not a collection aliquot. So collection aliquots are things like EDTA tubes, the urine cups, patch genes, things like that. So this is, these are aliquots that are created uh, from the primary aliquot. And so what we've done is that, uh, and, and I know this is going to be a little bit confusing now, but in about two slides, it'll, I'm hoping it'll be clear. Uh, so what we'll do is we copy down as many values from the parent as possible. So you have your parent collection device, and then you have all your child aliquots, and everything gets copied down directly from the parent. I already see some very confused faces, but you'll see, you'll see how this all fits together. So things like container type, matrix type, aliquot template, all copied down from the parent. Allow for self-recycling if needed. So one of the statuses that we added was recycled, and so that way they didn't have to enter anything. 
it automatically came into the, uh, into the database as recyclable. The, uh, we actually created a new container for the NUNC2 usage um, that the lab was making. And um, allow for end user editing. So we added a new event field that allowed the, uh, the idle plot when it got logged in to just bring up that same login field that they saw when they had the epic session and they can change any of the fields that they had uh, the ability to when they were first logging in. Because if you think about it, you're, they're already logging in information, they already had the ability to change the information to begin with. So now we're just presenting them with a second opportunity to do that. And then uh, finally, the goal of this process, Aliplot, was that it never needs to be changed regardless of parent device. So we could put any parent collection device on top of this, and this one will never need to change. The only time that it needs to be changed is if we're adding new functionality, like uh, if we wanted to start doing all DNA extractions directly from the process Aliplot, we're not set up that way. But if you wanted to do that, we could do that right through um, the process Aliplot. So this is what the template looks like. The, uh, I like to call this the one template that rules them all. Obviously, this isn't exactly one template. But you see how everything kind of lines up. You know, Everything is pretty much the same. We have the matrix type. I don't know if you can see this slide very well. Uh, you have the matrix type on the left, barcode, and so on and so forth. And they all just stack on top of each other. And this is the standard that we have for every collection device. So every collection device is going to have slightly different requirements. Like, for example, our patch genes have barcodes. Whereas our urine cups do not. We don't, we don't care about the barcode that's on the urine cup because we just throw it out. Um, but things like that are all exceptions. So the, it's, the way that this is done is that it's, it can be modular. So we can just copy that template and just change the options that are in that template to you know, display only or to be editable, to be required, a lot of stuff. The only, the only fields that are required on the screen are the count, lab condition, and then collected by. The lab condition is where they set whether it's uh, a recycled aliquot or not. And then the container changes through the workflow. Make sense? Okay. Alright, so this is this is the magic sauce. This is the magic sauce. So, um, so to, to maintain that reusability, we create new collection workflows every time. So we just do a copy and then we just change the things that we need to change. So remember how I talked about the copy down. So this is what happens. So this is actually a urine cup that has an event called process alpha. The uh, the alpha template that gets quote locked because once you're processed, you can't really change it, which in and of itself is posing some problems. So we might end up unlocking that. But we change the container here from urine cup to two mil nuc. So the parent device is what gets changed. So we tell the parent, hey, you're you're now going to be a two mil nuc at least for a little bit. And then we change the matrix type to whole urine. So we collect whole urine, supernatant, and urine pellet. So the matrix type gets, gets changed to whole urine, and then we split it five times. So realize here what's happening is that the parent now is behaving like a num tube. We've told it it's a num tube, and we're, told, we're telling it it's whole urine, and we've told it to now split five times. After that's done, we say, okay, now your urine supernatant. So we change that in the, in the matrix type here and then you split that five times. Do it again for your, uh, your health. After everything's been split out, we change the container back to your cup, and then the matrix type back to uh, your collection. And that's it. Because all the work is now being done at the process aliquot. And this urine aliquot, as, as far as the end user sees it, and as far as you're concerned, never changed. The keys here is that you've got to change everything back. So this standardization has revolutionized how we create these devices. Because if, if by some miracle, I get to finally study belly button lint, <laughs> we can create that device in a matter of a few, maybe minutes, maybe an hour. Because um, all we got to do is copy. Uh, I usually copy the EDTA tube just because that's the first one that I, that's basically where all of this was born. And then I just change the relevant information to, uh, to have that. So the, the only other time is that if you have new containers. So now I have to just create a new container for you know, belly button collection points. I don't know what you would collect it as. 
Um, but whatever, whatever it ends up being, you know, you can just create it, and that, that's your only stock gap now, or just very small things that are very easy to create. <clears throat> sample workflow is kind of the same thing. We had a sample for every study, which was incredibly inefficient. I imagine that we were probably one of the few people that did it that way. Uh, so we just created, uh, we just edited a template and put all of our studies right there. So now there's just one sample workflow to rule them on. That workflow doesn't do anything. It's very empty outside of just the default information. And then the lab uses this really nice add workflow button here on the upper left. The add workflows. I mean, they have a sheet of barcodes that tell them you know, what collection devices they need to add as part of their workflow. And that actually works really, really nice. Um, and this is just all standardized information to the left. I'm sorry, to the right. So here are the results. We have an 86% drop in tickets after this was released. I mean, the first couple, couple of weeks, it was a little pinky. A lot of people had to get used to it. But over, over a year, year on year, 86% decrease on tickets. We moved from, hey, pants on fire, we need to put the fire out kind of mentality to a now much more acceptable dev, uh, DevOps shop. Uh, so today, the tickets are more advanced problems, like they accessioned something incorrectly and they didn't get the, they didn't get the output that they were looking for. It's very rare, but it does happen. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if you want to do a new study and they're just about to rule it out, hey, no problem. If you just give us a few hours, we can usually get it up and running, have it tested, um, get ready to go, to a point where I wouldn't even do it in depth. It's, this is this is so solid. I'm, I'm saying things that I know are sacrilegious, but this is just, this is so solid. You could do this straight in production. That that that's how that's how much I believe in it. And I know Kimberly is probably going to give me a lot of flack for this, but no, well, I, I believe. I mean, I I mean, the changes you 100% know are trivial. I will make it. <laughs> it's not validated lips. Yes. If it's a non an R and D, then I would make it. Myself, but so I one talk. Works, not one. Nine one. Nine one. By the way, so another benefit when you upgrade is that when you're on Windows 2012, Nautilus uses all of the Windows themes. So you can hmm. change the color of the borders. You can make it bold font, bigger font, and it doesn't look like Windows NT window anymore. Yeah, so, yeah, that is probably one so of the biggest know. biggest things when new it people looks come in. It a lot in. more yeah. modern just from the Windows themes. Yeah. So you'll notice that when you when you do upgrade. Yeah. So I, I, I'm also looking for the apply and go to uh, apply. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like so that's one of the things I really want to use. Swap the notes back at the end. That yeah. note would do that for yeah. you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so again, new collection devices. Uh, those those are super easy now. We can roll those out. Usually we that within an hour. Um, again, based on various things that are else going on, but usually pretty quickly. Um, so the, the other thing is that we're no longer putting out fires. If it is a fire, it's often <laughs> much more much more ingrained into the system, and usually takes, uh, takes us out maybe a couple minutes. Users have more control, which they really, really, really like. Uh, it also comes with that responsibility, but you know, errors still occur, but it's, it's, it, it doesn't take us away from the job of us administering the system. And like I said, this, is, this has been a huge turnaround for how it is that we develop. Now, are there still things that, we, that do still take two to three uh, months to develop passively? Like we just rolled out something called cell culture, where they're doing splits and pulls, splits and pulls, and that was about two weeks of development time. Um, and we rolled out a 16S extraction, which uh, Rachel actually led that on, uh, which I definitely appreciate it. And so um, and I'm willing to take any questions that you guys might have regarding universal accession and how we're doing it wrong. <laughs> we're doing it right, that's okay to, yes, in the back. So, um, since you are rolling things now within an hour, do you do user testing of uh, the configuration? Yeah, so part of the SOP is, uh, let me just repeat your question in case no one could hear. Uh, she's asked, um, once we roll something out in an hour, do we still test it? So the answer to that is yes. Yeah. So part of the SOP is to, is to accession a blank sample uh, to make sure that all of the fields are getting updated in the way that we anticipated. So like I said, the, the tricky part is going to be this switching that happens. So making sure that you switch everything correctly and then everything got switched back. So that, that's, that's the most cumbersome part of this. So once the user confirms that it's working as expected, yes. then um, you put it in production? Or yes. you're already in production? 
Uh, so yeah, I, like I said, I'm confident enough in this process that we release it, we do it straight in production. It, it, it's very unintrusive, the way that, the way that, um, the way that this is done, because it's just a brand new aliquot that they don't even have a barcode for on their little station. And so, yeah. That's the other feature that we'd be looking forward to, is that high, that high, in, uh, or only login check box. For, for the workflow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also for the duplicate barcodes, and for, you, you can search by ID, external reference name in any of the windows. So mm -hmm. when you said, like, if someone it finds a primary instead of the other ID, you can turn that on. Yes, that's what we ended up doing. But, but for a long time, we didn't know what was causing that problem. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, just, I'm going to jump in, so we're like about four minutes yeah. behind yeah. schedule. Sure, Sorry. So we should probably uh, move on to the next presentation. So we'll